Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for High Velocity Radio. Lee Cantor here, another episode of High Velocity Radio, and this is going to be a good one. Today's guest is Joe Milam, and he is with Angel Span. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, before we get too far into things, tell us about AngelSpan. How are you serving folks? Well, startups are our customers, but we think of investors as clients. Um, in the world of startup investing, there's really an absence of consistent and or good information coming from startups. So we deliver what you'd think of as Wall Street-like investor relations for startups, helping entrepreneurs communicate on a consistent basis, monthly updates and quarterly reports and the like. Um, and they pay us to do it. It's a professional service and a tech-enabled professional service. Um, but at the end of the day, the investors benefit because it gives them more and better information to either monitor the companies they've already invested in and give them good information on those startups they might be interested in investing at some point down the road. Now, Angel's in the name of your uh, company. So are you kind of creating this for the angel investor to give them enough information so they can make wise investments? Yeah, effectively, yes. Um, if you look at the world of, of who does invest today in startups, um, angels do participate, but in a fairly ad hoc way um, through angel groups and clubs and the like, or maybe even on their own. Uh, and then you've got, of course, the venture capitalists. But the, the market we're really going after to try and help get into angel investing or startup investing, I should say, or would think of as the uh, what we call legacy capital, sort of the old money the family offices and the folks that are looking to support American capitalism and American entrepreneurial capitalism. But because they have professionals that are overseeing their financial affairs and the like, they need to be able to invest in a manner that's a bit more professional, a bit more institutionally rigorous in the risk management practices and the like. So the markets we're really trying to draw into um, this, this entrepreneurial funding world is sort of a new participant that is really sort of on the sidelines looking in and wants to do it. But you've got to, they want to do it in a, in a bit more professional way. And then so from the uh, startup standpoint, you're there as a service to help them kind of um, grow up a little bit in terms of the information <laughs> that they capture so that they can present it to these new, this new pool of p potential funders for them that may have not uh, invested in this, this kind of startup community in the past or maybe were more hesitant. At I, that's exactly I think that's a wonderful summary. And I, and the, the proper phrase you, you coined there is grow up because the current way that most entrepreneurs try and raise money is through the charm of their pitch process and how well their team all presents themselves in some sort of demo day sort of environment or pitching to an angel group themselves. So it's much more of a transactional sales process than it really is informing potential investors on What's the business, where it's at, where are the risks, um, what's your status in your natural startup life cycle journey? So the, these more sophisticated investors can make more informed investment choices. And, uh, and our goal is also to help those, those investors take much more of a portfolio approach. So assemble a portfolio of startups that you may fall within a theme or a thesis you're interested in, uh, as opposed to being uh, charmed by an individual transactional approach. Now, I was just speaking with a, um, a founder of a startup earlier today, and he was saying when he coaches other uh, startups, uh, he finds that a lot of times they get hung up on the technology story mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how clever it is, and they don't really get to the how, what problem do they solve story that's usually more interesting to the customer. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's exactly right. Um we what we produce for our clients is what what we think of as very objective. Um, think of it as dry. We don't want the monthly updates and the quarterly reports we produce to be sexy like a pitch deck or a marketing sort of collateral or materials. It's much more aligned with what Standard and Poor's might produce on a public company or Value Line, which is what I started reading in college. Um, very fact-based, standardized layout, standardized format to take that sizzle out of that conversation because it's not necessary and nor is it appropriate. Um, the sizzle is for the in-person conversations, but there's a lot of coaching we do, like this entrepreneur you spoke to, in making sure these entrepreneurs balance how they're communicating to these investors to make sure that the entrepreneurs answer three questions. Every one of our clients, I take them through this exercise. 
I say, who cares if you're successful? Because if you're pitching wealthy people, it's not about the money. You can't start there. They have to care. I mean, and to put a finer point to that, last year, uh, wealthy people in the United States gave away over $300 billion to nonprofits because they cared. So what motivates this audience of investors is not because they need more money or they're doing it for ego or something to brag about at the country club. They're well past that. They have to care about your success and they want to be part of that journey. And then, oh, by the way, if there's a positive financial outcome, that's icing on the cake and that they'll take that money and probably go support other startups they care about. That's really the narrative that needs to be emphasized. And so while we make sure that the sort of pedantic monthly updates and quarterly reports, the facts are communicated properly, we do a lot of handholding and coaching with our clients to, to make sure they get that phrase uh, really dialed. You know, who, who's going to care and why should they care? And then we get them to answer why you and your team and why now? Why is this idea now timely such that these people that care about the concept of what you're solving for are going to feel a sense of, I don't want to say urgency, but certainly an interest to move quick enough to help that entrepreneur raise the money they need. So now the two constituents that you serve, the startups to help them kind of formalize some of their process and communicate some of the nuts and bolts of their business, and also kind of these um, these burgeoning funds or maybe who haven't tapped into the startup world. Um, do you work with each of the, each of those constituents are important to you, right? So you have to help the startup get the materials to show the people who have the money. And then you have to show the people that have the money that this is uh, an endeavor worth supporting. Again, Lee, that's exactly right. My, my personal background is I ran a multifamily office for 20 years, and I was a securities analyst, and we built portfolios, and clients paid us a fee, and just like any other RIA, we had full discretion and power of attorney, and, and we were in a position of trust with very wealthy people. And the firm I, I ran, I actually had joined a firm, eventually took over. Uh, it had been recently been bought by the uh, European bank right before I joined it, and then my predecessor who, who sold his firm to the bank died of cancer. And I took over the business. So I've been in this position as an investor managing, as a fiduciary, other people's money. And so I still have that loyalty to investors. I still want to take care of the investors. But to, for them to be better investors and more successful, we need to get good information coming from the entrepreneurs first. And so that's the core service that AngelSpan we built first. And then the analytics that we provide as a result of delivering these monthly updates really benefits the investor side to make, again, more informed and educated and less emotion-driven or, or less transaction transactional approach to, to investing. So when you're having the conversation with the startup, um, are, are they fully understanding the value you provide or this is kind of news to them in terms of what you're telling them to do and the, and the activities you're asking them to prioritize? Well, again, that's a great question. And, and what we have found is that first-time entrepreneur, that 20-something that's full of passion and they think they've discovered something new and by gosh, they're going to go change the world and build a unicorn, right? That we'll, we'll just call them the naive entrepreneur. They, It's oftentimes said, and it's true, that they don't know what they don't know. So we really don't sell to them. Um, they get referred to us by investors. And we've been working very hard to educate investors why they should require AngelSpan on any company they're even vaguely interested in because it's part of a de-risking process and it gives them better information to make a more informed choice at, at some point down the road. So that early stage entrepreneur, the first timer, they really are a difficult customer for us because they really don't understand how important this is. The serial entrepreneur that's been there and done it, and is on their second or third startup, they sign up with us one phone call in 10 minutes because they know how important this is. They've already learned those lessons. They also know how difficult it is to get right. And when we talk to them about the fact that, that we do the curation, we, we're, they're really outsourcing this to us. And, and we have a staff we assign every, every startup client. And for the price we charge, it's a no-brainer. We oftentimes have that serial entrepreneurs that sign up, say, yes, I want it. Oh, by the way, what's it cost? And, and when we have that exchange, I actually say, what do you think it costs? And we have two levels of service. And, and more times than not, the, the um, lower level of service, they typically figure it's four times what we charge. 
and the higher level of service, it's oftentimes guessed at four to five times what we charge. So it's just from a price standpoint for people that really understand how both important this is to get right and how difficult it is to get right and value their own time, they realize we're more than a bargain. And it's an important part of part of their brand and their company's brand. Now, what does it require for that startup founder and his team to pull this off? Like, what do they like? What kind of interaction is this a, a weekly call, a monthly reporting of uh, information? Like what is required of the startup? Yeah, we, we go through an onboarding process. And again, we have a platform. We, we hesitate to call it software because that has implications of, you know, you've got to go through a learning curve and learn how to use the software. And our platform is really a receptacle. We've made it really easy for the entrepreneurs just to put information down in the platform. They can just put it in a singular box. They can, we're connected to Slack if they use Slack, so they can just drop it into their Slack channel. It'll get dropped into our platform, and then our team goes and curates it. So, And then as we approach the end of the monthly cycle, because best practices is recognized as a monthly operational update going out to your investors, potential investors, and other stakeholders. Um, our team will then go reach out to them through email. Uh, they, the, every startup has uh, the phone number of their point person. So, but we find that email is typically the, the, the way that the communication going, but it's ongoing and the coaching and nudging is ongoing. If they ever have questions. They always have access to their, their point person. I'm always available. I generally debrief with them after they've gotten a couple of monthly updates out and ask them how their experience was. And then I start coaching them on the messaging and how to find investors that might already show they care about what they're working on. And there's a there's some really interesting ways to reverse engineer how you can actually find investors that have already written checks showing they care about the very cause that entrepreneur is working on. So you're also helping at some level uh, to help them get funding maybe another round uh, down the road based on the information you're gathering? Exactly. The the key to what we're doing and the, really the IP is called the Bell Mason Diagnostic. And your listeners would do themselves a real favor by just going looking that up on Google. Um, but Gordon Bell was the inventor of the mini computer when he uh, uh, worked at Digital Equipment Corp in the 60s and 70s. And then he went out to Silicon Valley in the early 80s and was a mentor to a lot of startups. And he found that they had really valuable ideas and, and viable marketplaces and good technology ideas, but they didn't know how to build businesses to monetize over a sustained period their good idea. And so he worked with the, the old accounting firm Coopers and Librand and a gal named Heidi Mason and created what's called the Bell Mason Diagnostic, which is, and then they back tested it over thousands of companies back in the 80s. And this is the most rigorous playbook and roadmap of the entire startup lifecycle journey. Essentially, what should a startup do and when should they do it at a real granular milestone level? And well, Gordon's an investor in our company. And we have this Bell Mason that not only structures and informs the monthly updates, but we score them against this Bell Mason every month. And that's part of our service is we give that report back to our startups. It's one level of service. So they can actually see how they're executing against this very rigorous playbook. They can see the gaps. They can see where they're ahead. They can use this to communicate to their investors. You put it as part of their communication to their board of directors if they've assembled one at that stage. Um, and so it is, it's what structures the updates. But by scoring them, we can also now start creating a longitudinal view on how well they're executing against this very rigorous playbook, which is objective research. So we actually, part of our services, we coach our clients, look at here's where you're doing well, but here's where you're, you know, you got to pick up the pace here. Because you're struggling in these areas and you need to put your resources there. Now, that's not done on a lot of hand-holding. We don't take a lot of time. We give them that information. And then what they do with it is the reflection on whether they're a quality team or not. So we give them essentially the, the ability to separate themselves from the crowd or not. And that's that objective view we, we retain. So when investors come to us, say, tell us about your best companies. We have data to define it. Not because we think the market's huge and it's a quality team. We're simply objectively looking at how successfully they're navigating the Bell Mason diagnostic and the velocity they're doing it, because that really defines good or bad. Now, what are some of the elements of that diagnostic? Is I'm assuming finances is part of it, leadership, maybe sales, marketing, things like that. What are what are some of the components? <laughs> you are spot on. There are four major pillars of any business, the team, the product itself, whatever that product may be, the market, 
What market are you going after? And then operations. Now, each one of those four pillars has three subtopics. So, for example, under operations, that's got accounting, legal, and finance. Under team, it's internal leadership team, internal operating team, and external leadership team, advisory board, board of directors. Under product is can you build it? Can you deliver it? Can you protect it? And then market is what is the market you're going after? And then marketing and sales. So you're exactly right. There are subcategories, and then there are specific milestones associated with those 12 subtopics for each of the five natural life cycle stages of a startup. So you don't need to have a board of directors when you're raising your seed round, right? That's a milestone that comes later. And so the sequencing of these appropriate and necessary operational milestones is is like building a building from the ground up. There are certain things you do at certain stages of building that building. You can think of the four pillars of a building as electrical plumbing, um, foundation work, and uh, carpentry, the walls and ceilings. But as you're standing up that building, the specific milestones on those four areas are, are change. Same thing with a business. And that's what Gordon and Heidi and Coopers and Labyrinth identified as what are the right things to do in a proper sequence, all the way at a fairly granular level. And then they that- created a way to assign a numerical value to a lot of these early stage milestones, which don't show up on the income statement or balance sheet, except for maybe a salary expense, but they're the accomplishment of an important milestone, like filing for IP or securing IP, right? That really doesn't show up on the financial statements other than maybe an expense, but it's an important operational milestone and it deserves to have value assigned it because you created value by securing IP. And then this comes into play when you're working with your other constituents, the people with the money. So this gives them kind of a way to compare apples to apples. Bingo. Apples to apples on the stage of the company, the velocity of the operational traction, how quickly they're building the business. They can make an objective view of a good company so that when they come to us and say, we like to invest in seed stage companies that are in this sort of business model and have this level of revenue, which of your companies fit that? I can show them objectively which ones do. Now, have the tax laws changed in order to make this more attractive to uh, these people with money in order to invest in the startups? Thank you for asking, because this is a this is a topic that has sadly gotten way too little attention. Um, There have been tax laws on the books for a long time. Um, One of them did get modernized or updated, I should say, as recent as 2015. Um, and that's these both of these laws fall under what's called the qualified small business stock QSBS tax incentives under sections 1244 and 1202. Now they only apply to taxable investors, so think individual investors, wealthy people. And the original law 1244 was passed in 1958, and it allows for losses on your angel investing to be deductible against taxable income. And that deductibility is actually a more favorable write-off than if you gave an equivalent amount of money to charity. Remember my point earlier is that wealthy people gave away $300 billion last year knowing they were going to lose it all because they cared about the cause. What if a portion of that was directed to invest in startups? Even under a worst-case scenario, it's still a better financial transaction if the startup fails because the investor can write off more than if they gave that same money to charity. That's under Section 1244. Now, that was passed in 1958, and it was actually updated and modernized, basically um, indexing the levels and limits that apply to the taxpayer that they could write off uh, to inflation, right? In 1958, it allowed for the first half a million dollars going into startup investing to get coverage under this favorable treatment. But in 1978, due to inflation, a dollar in 1958, what was that worth in 78? Well, literally, it was twice. So they raised the levels to a million dollars. The first million dollars gets covered. But that law actually hasn't been updated since 1978 because it's just been overlooked by accountants, venture capitalists, investors. It's just been buried in the code. And so we've actually spent a fair amount of time both educating people in these tax laws, but also lobbying to get 1244 indexed to inflation again because it would both draw attention to it as new tax law. If you just update it, it becomes technically new tax law. But it could also, again, help a lot more investors recognize, my gosh, I can invest more money in startups. And even in a worst case scenario, 
it's still a better financial outcome than if I gave it to the university. You know, UT gets has in Harvard and these these universities got way too much money. They don't need the money. And so these 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 wealthy folks can direct their benevolent dollars into entrepreneurial ventures and still it be a prudent financial outcome under any scenario. Now, the other tax law that was passed in 93, it's called QSBS under Section 1202. And that one was actually updated in, in as late as 2015 under the PATH Act uh, signed by Obama, December of 15th, I think, of 2015. It allows for very favorable treatment on t- profits. So if you invest successfully and you have an exit, then if from the time you invested to the time that there was a profitable transaction, an exit, if it took five years, then that taxable investor, each shareholder on each company, can exclude the first $10 million of profits from paying capital gains taxes. It's literally tax-free profits for the first $10 million per transaction, per shareholder with no limits. So if you have 10 companies, all have successful exits in any given year, you've got $100 million of of tax-free profits before you ever have to recognize capital gains. And that's another law that most people don't know about. More people do. Um, but it really, when it got updated in 2015, there has been article after article. Um, in fact, there was one last year in the New York Times about uh, the, the early shareholders of LinkedIn. When Microsoft bought LinkedIn, um, the early shareholders didn't even know about this. And CPAs don't know about these things because they're just sort of falling through the cracks. And so, yeah, we spent a lot of time and energy. We've got recorded webinars and stuff just educating people on these tax laws. Just go look it up. Put this information in front of your accountant. Because once they look at it, they'll go, holy cow, this has been a missed opportunity. Now, what if the um, QSBS was updated and re-indexed for inflation through today? What, how much money could that uh, have? Well, there's there's two components to the law. Um, as it stands today, under the $1978, the first million dollars of, of money going into a startup from outside investors. This doesn't qualify for the insiders putting their own sort of bootstrap money. Um, the first million dollars goes in and that a taxable investor can write off up to in a joint tax return, a hundred thousand dollars per year of 1244 losses, a single filer. It's 50,000. That's the current law as it stands today. If we index it, everything goes up by a factor of 3.8. So the first $3.8 million gets coverage under 1244. So this really applies to both your early stage investing and maybe your a round or Hex, maybe even B rounds for some companies that aren't in the big cities. And then a, ta- a joint tax return, a family could write off up to $380,000 per year, reducing your taxable income dollar for dollar. And then a single filer, $180,000 or $195,000, half that. So it's literally a compelling opportunity to, for people that want to be active and in, in, in supporting startups and want to do it in an efficient, after tax way um, to really de risk the process. Right. Well, I mean, it's a risky process as it is, and most of them aren't going to be profitable. So, well, that's right. Can... Why wouldn't you want to right. lower your after tax risk by saying, <laughs> exactly. let's let the government shoulder some of the pain of, of a, a failed uh, investment? Right. But that's what the driver of the economy is. So, I mean, yep. it's a price worth paying. It's a price worth paying. And one of the other things that, that investors, really need to think about because this is this is some of the things we're introducing to the investor side of this equation is we're trying to introduce more sophisticated ways to manage your angel and venture investing process, bringing sort of Wall Street sort of behavior. Because as I manage money in this multifamily office, everything we did was always thinking of the after-tax implications. For wealthy people, it's one of the major drivers of how happy are they with an outcome. So what's the after-tax implications? whether it's their estate plan, whether it's muni bonds versus treasury bonds. I mean, there's there's a whole myriad of things that if you can minimize taxes, they'll, they'll even give up some absolute return if it's more tax efficient. And so by introducing these tax laws, we're bringing that sort of practices to the angel investing world. And the second thing we're doing is helping investors understand that they can also manage other risks. So their actual investment returns have a higher probability of success just through managing the discrete risks of any prudent investment strategy, non-systematic risk, which is the transaction risk, the company-specific risk, 
this company versus that company. That's the non-systematic risk. That is only managed properly through diversification. That's why mutual funds and ETFs and all these instruments out there are properly diversified. Yet most people invest in startups have highly concentrated portfolios, which means you're compounding non-systematic risk in what is otherwise a riskier asset than, than what people do typically in the public market investing. So by diversifying more and building more broadly diversified portfolios, you can actually manage non-systematic risk much better and improve your probability of having a good financial outcome. This, the second yeah. thing is through what's called systematic risk, which is timing risk, market risk, and some of my people I might say thesis risk. You know, you don't want to invest in a perfectly diversified portfolio of buggy whip manufacturers, for example. So that's thesis risk or market risk. Um, and so the only way to manage that is through what's called dollar cost averaging, investing in multiple sequences, multiple rounds, if you will. That's how you manage timing risk. So through proper diversification, multiple funding rounds, optimizing on the after-tax um, implications of your choices, we can actually start creating not only having more money flow into startups, but those investors have a better experience along the way. Now, Joe, if there's a serial entrepreneur out there that would like to get a hold of you or somebody on your team, what's the website and best way to connect with you? Yeah, angelspan.com. Um, they can go on there and download some white papers if they'd like, and that would um, be dropped into our CRM so we would follow up. Or they can reach me at joe at angelspan.com. They reach out to me directly and said they heard from, uh, heard from us uh, on the radio, your radio show. Now, are you working with like incubators and kind of the startup community to, um, you know, kind of get the word out amongst a bunch of people all at one time? Or are you work with the individual startups? We really don't market directly to startups. Uh, again, they come to us through referral always. Um, it's just for a, a whole myriad of reasons. The as I mentioned, the more mature entrepreneurs, they typically talk to their buddies, or they might have even been an angel investor and seen our monthly updates from something they'd already invested in, even though they're starting their own business. Um, so they find out about us and they come to us. But to answer your question, yes, we're educating the accelerators. We're, we've got a number of them that are recommending us, um, not requiring us yet, but we're training them how if they simply built AngelSpan into their process of even selecting entrepreneurs, they would have a higher caliber of entrepreneurs entering their program and thus likely driving better successful outcomes as well. So we're in that stage of educating the accelerators, but we've got a number of them around the country that are recommending us and, and those sorts of things. The real value for us is because they're, they're dealing with, in large part, those earlier stage entrepreneurs I was speaking of earlier, where they really don't know what they don't know. That's why they're going through an accelerator. So that's a really a much longer sell cycle. The more experienced entrepreneurs, they sign up right away. Um, investors say, no, just go use AngelSpan. So yesterday, for example, um, a gentleman who used to be the head of Intel Capital, the corporate venture arm of Intel, um, he is not only recommending us to Intel Capital, he's recommending us to the other corporate VCs, but and all the startups that are coming to him. And he literally said, I wish I had this when I was running Intel Capital. So that's a sort of endorsement we get that makes eliminates the reasons why any entrepreneur might want to throw up as to why they aren't willing to be properly transparent, because we've really eliminated the excuses. So any other reason not to be transparent, you're now raising your hand in the, and saying, look, at, I'm probably a little bit less worthy entrepreneur at this stage because I, I still don't know what I don't know. I'm even having people of that credibility say this is the right thing to do and you're still hesitating. That means you're probably not investable yet. Right. And so then you need to get in front of more of these venture investors and angel investor groups that are, they're already looking in that area, but you're giving them a system that helps them look oh, yeah. more efficiently. It just improves outcomes, both in managing their deal flow, their due diligence process and their investment process and the outcomes. So yeah, we, we really bring uh, some great efficiencies to folks that want to be better. You know, not just do it casually, not just ad hoc, maybe invest in one or two deals a year, but really want their processes to be better and frankly, more professional. Good stuff, Joe. Well, congratulations on all your success and we appreciate the work you're doing. And once again, that's angelspan.com for more information. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We will see you all next time on High Velocity Radio. Mm -hmm. 